Good morning. My name is Diana Donlin, and I direct the Soil Solutions Program at Center for Food Safety, one of the organizations that is sponsoring the conference. Um, it is my great honor to welcome Congressman Jared Huffman to our conference this morning. Um, Congressman Huffman represents California's second district, which is a district that spans from the Golden Gate Bridge all the way to the Oregon border and encompasses six counties. So that is a lot of rangeland and a lot of potential for soil carbon sequestration. Um, Senator Huffman is a member of the Committee on Natural Resources and the House Committee of Transportation and Infrastructure. Prior to his election in 2012, he served six years in the California State Assembly where he authored more than 60 pieces of successful legislation. Congressman Huffman is also a very good friend of Center for Food Safety. For Earth Day last year, he sponsored our Congressional Soil Briefing on, on Capitol Hill. The event was packed with congressional staffers who were eager to learn about the fundamental importance of soil health. He also sponsored a screening of, uh, Rebecca, of Deborah Kunz Garcia's film, Symphony of the Soil for Us, at the Congressional Theater, which I think is really an excellent use of the People's Theater. It is likely that Congressman Huffman understands soil carbon sequestration more than any other member of Congress. This movement to rebuild soil health from the bottom up and the top down, um, both prongs will be necessary. Fortunately, we have a progressive ally at the top. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Huffman. Well, thanks for that wonderful introduction, and good morning, everyone. When I'm described as uh, the member of Congress that knows the most about uh, soil carbon issues, uh, the bar is very low, just so you know that. Uh, but I do appreciate the introduction. It's great to be with all of you. And I want you to know that I uh, am such an enthusiastic supporter of your work that even a broken ankle couldn't keep me away, but that's the answer if you see me hobbling a little bit. Um, I want to confess to you that sometimes I feel like I actually do live in two different worlds. Um, this, of course, and, and my gorgeous district from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border, uh, I consider the real world. And in the real world, we have all sorts of passionate people, like all of you, who look at the rapid and ominous changes in the world, everything from bleached coral reefs to ocean acidification and the, our melting Arctic, the extreme weather, wildfires, the eminent loss of entire island nations. You look at all of that and, of course, you know without necessarily understanding how climate models actually work. You still know that climate change is very real, and it's frightening, and you think about what that means for future generations and for natural systems as they've existed for thousands of years. And, of course, you want to do something about it because you understand it as a moral, economic, and environmental imperative. And being problem solvers, you get to work, and you're coming up with all sorts of creative ways where we can use innovation uh, to come up with viable and in some cases even lucrative solutions to actually reversing climate change. So that's the real world uh, and I absolutely love it. But then there's the place that I fly to on most Mondays. Uh, it has the potential to be connected to the real world, but right now uh, it is actually a world of fantasy and greed and science denial. I am talking, of course, about the current Republican Congress. Uh, we know that in the real world, things are, are going in a pretty good direction. The, the number of folks who accept clients, climate science is at an all-time high. The number of folks who uh, are climate deniers is at an all-time low. Uh, a recent poll I saw said that 73% of voters actually embrace climate science and get it. 56% of Republicans, even. 
Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that apparently all the remaining climate deniers serve with me in the House of Representatives. And, and some of them are very sheepish about the way they deny climate change. You know, the, the most common uh, statement they make is, well, I'm not a scientist. Uh, or some of them will say, you know, there's some scientists that really debate that, and so I want to watch the debate and kind of see where it goes. Uh, but others, uh, usually the ones from big fossil fuel states, are, are even more brazen about it. I had one colleague who used to just delight in saying things like, uh, like this. He would say, the best thing about the earth is when you poke holes in it, oil and gas comes out. That mentality, uh, and actually the millions and millions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry that are perpetuating this dwindling mentality, uh, is really what we're up against. But I do want you to know, I think we're winning. And I want to thank all of you here in the real world for doing your part uh, to keep our momentum going. I've long been impressed uh, with the work of the Soil Not Oil Coalition, what you're doing to galvanize scientists and environmental organizations and just regular concerned citizens for better management of the land. Because you realize that poor land management is actually a huge part of why we're in this climate problem. And you also realize that the flip side of that, better land management, uh, could be a huge part of the solution in, in turning the corner and reversing climate change. And I, I think about that in the context of our federal public lands. We have a huge amount of federal public land in this country. And you would think it would be uh, a net part of the solution. You'd think it would be a sponge, a place where we're sequestering carbon and that we should really be focusing on other areas um, to, to address climate change. It's actually uh, the opposite of that. Our federal public lands are net emitters. They're net contributors to the problem of climate change. There's a number of reasons for that. Part of it, of course, is uh, a very antiquated and subsidized leasing program for the extraction of coal, oil, and gas, and other mining activities that happen on our federal lands. That has to be dramatically changed. Frankly, it needs to be phased out as quickly as possible and eliminated. Um, but it also, it also includes uh, the fact that wildfires are ravaging uh, many of our federal public forest lands. It includes also the fact that uh, we have poor grazing practices on millions and millions of acres of federal public land. For example, the land managed by uh, the Bureau of Land Management. And uh, I've taken an interest in this going back several years, really. Uh, my friend and constituent John Wick is here. Many of you are familiar with the pioneering work he's doing at the Marin Carbon Project. And back at least five or six years ago when I was in the California State Assembly, he came to me and wanted to brief me on the work that he was doing uh, on, on rangeland management out in West Marin County. And, and I'm interested in these things, so I, I was anxious to find out more about it. I thought, well, gosh, maybe, maybe there's something about native grasses and biodiversity that we can take away from this work. This, this sounds really nice. Uh, what I came to find out uh, is that this is much, much bigger, uh, and that there's much more going on, much greater possibilities, possibilities that actually are global. Um, and it's very exciting. And so when I had a chance in 2014, I sit on the Natural Resources Committee, and they were having an informational hearing on, um, on uh, grazing and ranch, uh, uh, rangeland management. And I asked if we could bring John Wick out as a witness to talk about the type of rangeland management uh, he was exploring and, and learning about. And to my pleasant surprise, the chair of the committee, Rob Bishop of Utah, who is very much a climate denier, uh, agreed to do that uh, because it turns out he had some constituents in Utah and the, there were others in other western states who are kind of finding their way uh, to some of the same conclusions that John Wick and his colleagues are finding, that this actually uh, is, is amazing. The possibilities are remarkable, and even if you're not doing it for purposes of climate change, uh, this can lead to actually more productive and successful uh, rangeland activities. So we had this hearing, and, and John came out and did a terrific job testifying about his work. And I thought that was really important, because when someone like John Wick talks to this audience, you know, he's, he's got you at hello. Uh, you're already with him. 
Uh, but when he goes into the halls of Congress and starts telling his story to a bunch of skeptical Republicans, and when they start to kind of nod and get it, um, that's really something. Uh, all of a sudden, we're opening up possibilities for collaboration that could break the logjam on some of these things. And so I was pleased that after that hearing, even some of the most hardened climate deniers, even the chair of our Natural Resources Committee, uh, told me that he was kind of interested in this and wanted to possibly work together on it. And so we started developing this idea uh, for a bill. And I will tell you that in Congress, um, it's nice when you have uh, a Republican colleague who rejects climate change that says, I might be interested in working with you on something that feels like it's a breakthrough. Translating that to action is really hard. And the last two years, uh, we have not been able to get Chairman Bishop to actually uh, co-sponsor a bill with me, even though we've really been reaching out and, and pursuing that collaboration. Uh, but we nevertheless came up with a bill that we think Republicans ought to support. And we introduced it in May. We don't talk a lot about climate change in this bill because um, you just can't talk about that sort of thing right now uh, in the Republican Congress, but you might not need to. So we talk about healthy soils, and it kind of gets you to the same place. And we introduced uh, a bill in May that we call the Healthy Soils and Rangeland Management Solutions Act. And what it does is it, it tries to um, lay out a framework for some federal pilot projects that will uh, accelerate uh, the progress that we've begun to see on these issues, move us forward in a way where um, the Department of Interior would create um, a framework for these pilot projects, they would do regular reporting back to Congress, and we would kind of lay the foundation for um, possibly reforming the way we manage all of our federal public lands, at least the ones uh, that are grazed. But there are other possibilities. We could look at forest land management as part of this as well. So I'm excited about it. And you've seen the numbers. You've got experts uh, that are going to be talking to you about this at this, uh, at this gathering. Uh, you know that if we enhance uh, soil root mass carbon capture um, through these grazing practices, we can actually uh, sequester 35 to 75 percent more carbon uh, and make ranching more productive. So that's pretty exciting. That, that's a real sweet spot. And uh, the fact that these projects make sense economically is, I think, really how we're going to grow support for this con concept. And I'll keep working on it in Congress. We'll see what the election brings. I'm not sure that this bill is going to get a hearing or a vote in what's left of this Congress, but we're not going away. Uh, on this issue. I think we're on to something really big and really important. Now the other uh, really big and important piece of this, and I know you're talking about it at this conference as well, is keeping fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Uh, the science clearly tells us that we need to keep about 80 percent of the remaining known fossil fuel reserves in the ground if we're just going to hold the line on climate change. We may need to do even better than that if we're going to affirmatively reverse it. And so I'm really pleased to be the lead author in the House of Representatives on a bill called the Keep It in the Ground Act, which attempts to do that. So this would kind of do what I alluded to a few, a few uh, minutes ago. It would basically shut down uh, fossil fuel leasing, fossil fuel extraction from our public lands, including off our shores. Um, I was pleased that I have almost 40 co-sponsors on this bill so far in the House. And I think that tells you a little bit about the progress we've made and, and the fact that I do believe we are winning on this subject. Um, I'm not sure a few years ago 40 members of Congress would have signed on for something as bold and audacious as shutting down fossil fuel extraction off our shores and on our public lands. But they're doing it now. I think we'll have even more sponsors uh, in the months ahead. And I know that we'll be working with folks like you all over the country to move this forward. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions that time allows, and somebody will tell me when I need to leave the stage. You're telling me right now I need yeah, to leave sorry. the stage. That's it. We're done. Okay. Thanks. Please, for our wonderful congressman who's representing us.
in the belly of the beast in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Congressman Huffman, for coming to Richmond this morning to be with us.